I have the pleasure to uh, ask uh, Kate Morris, uh, a professor of social work from uh, the University of Sheffield. Was it <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, we are running a little bit late, I'm sorry, but take all the time we have promised you. So, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's my first time in Finland. You uh, may have noticed an obvious mistake, which is I'm obviously trying to think we haven't had our recent general election, and I'm back in 2014 rather than 15. So I apologise about that. It's a typing error. Um, and I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit today about families who have multiple and ongoing uh, engagement with a range of welfare services. And in order to do that, I'm going to draw on a number of studies that I've completed with those families. I think it's really important to say that families have a, an important role to play in shaping the research, not just to be the subjects of research. So families should be sitting on advisory groups for research projects. They should be involved in the design of the research and in the analysis of the research. Uh, we are going to have to shorten that distance at some point between us and them, and conducting research on subjects is not a comfortable place for me to be. So I just wanted to say that first of all. Uh, we're, I'm going to draw on a study that I did with families who uh, a local authority identified as the uh, families who were m most in use, uh, very high users of a range of drug, alcohol, mental health, domestic violence and child protection services. I'm going to draw on a study with families whose, uh, within their family, a child had died as a result of abuse or neglect, and they'd taken part in a case review. We call them serious case reviews. And I'm also going to draw on a study that I'm doing with families who are involved in a family group conference service. So I'm going to speak across a range of those and try and give those families a voice in this, really. I am going to focus on practice. I think Breeze has beautifully set out the bigger picture, and I'm going to pay attention to how we uh, work with families in those circumstances. How do I know? Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, tell me if I go too fast as well. Please do. Um, I want to start by uh, just thinking a little bit about what we mean by family. And um, we've really shifted, I think, over the last couple of decades, in part helped by uh, the development in sociology of family studies, to think about how families do family rather than who is in your family. For a long time, certainly in the UK, we were preoccupied by who is in your family in terms of research. Increasingly, I think we've become able to understand what's important is how do families do family? How do they organize their relationships? How do they manage the way they live? And that may include blood relatives, non-blood relatives, all sorts of significant others. And certainly my research says that um, children don't hold a concept of family that is bound by uh, particular blood relationships or proximity. Children, certainly in the family decision-making studies, have a very broad view of what constitutes their family. They're also relational beings and very much connecting to what Bruges is saying. Children are not islands. They exist within a network. We practice often in a way that makes them islands, but their everyday lives, the context for the resolution of the vast majority of the problems children experience are their family. And we have to think creatively and innovatively about how we work with families. So um, the other thing I want to say is that uh, I think we all have the uncle in the tree. I don't think we live in perfect families. And somehow the families we work with are profoundly different from our families. I am not saying families are wonderful places for children to be at all times. They're certainly not. For some children, living with their immediate carers is neither safe nor appropriate. However, I also don't want us down a road where somehow we have great families and the families we work with have neglectful and awful families. We move in and out of crisis. We move in and out of trauma. And we, uh, we all have the uncle. And I've used that photograph for ages now when I've talked about families. And one day, somebody is going to say to me, oh, that's my family. 
And then I'm going to feel really embarrassed because I've been using their family photograph for years. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because um, Brige has talked quite a lot about this. But we have, uh, we have a significant change in the tone and the nature of the settlement between the family and the state when we're thinking about children and family services in the UK. We saw the introduction of the 1989 Act, which was preoccupied by the notion of children in need. And underpinning it was some thinking around partnerships, around family support. We went through a, a stage where the government became preoccupied by what they called high-risk, high-harm families. So these were families that were costing the state significant money and, and, and causing all sorts of untold damage. And now we have shifted to a narrative that is about feckless and failing families. Families that fail to make the right choices. Families that fail to be the parents they could be and should be. Uh, that somehow willfully opt out of the appropriate care of their children. And that allows a discourse to arise which is about families as natural disasters. And in fact, I'll use a quote in a minute from a, a, a minister that does that. And alongside that, we've seen a substantial increase in child protection investigations in England. I don't know if that's a, a similar trend for you here. We have something like an 80% increase in child protection investigations. What's really significant within that is 60% of those investigations are unfounded. No harm is found. If you think about the relationship for you as a practitioner with families, when that means that for the vast majority of families coming into contact with you, what they're experiencing is an investigation with no harm proven, it's a very difficult footing to have a working relationship on. And of course, those with the least resources are experiencing the greatest scrutiny. And we just touched on Paul Bywater's study uh, absolutely for us, uh, although there are differing rates across the UK, there is no doubt that you can map across levels of poverty and deprivation and the rate at which we intervene in children's lives. And you are more likely to be removed from your family and you are more likely to be the subject of a child protection investigation if you live in poverty. And yet poverty has kind of fallen out of social work conversations. So it's a very difficult, I think, time for us as practitioners. And we have uh, the rise of what we call the uh, in England, uh, the troubled families discourse. I don't know if you have a similar one here in Finland. So this is a notion. Um, some senior civil servant, about probably now, a decade ago, decided that 120,000 families in the UK were the cause of the vast majority of problems. These were troubled families, and we had to go in, and we had to turn around the lives of these troubled families. Those statistics have been debated and shown to be very, very flawed. But it allowed the rise of this notion of this cohort of families that are impossible to change, that are resistant. Um, and indeed, we have got ourselves locked into a discussion where uh, non-cooperation is seen to be an indication of risk. Of course it's not. Whether or not a family is or isn't cooperating you, with you tells you nothing about the risk to a child. But in England, we have tripped into non-cooperation equals risk. And so we have this kind of uh, discourse around uh, families. And this is really complicated territory for families because you've got to navigate as a family your way through this territory that says you're feckless and failing because you're not looking after your children properly. But we also have in the UK the rise of kinship care. And so what happens is, some bit of your family is found wanting, unable to care for your child properly, and then we say as a practitioner to the other bit of the family, could you look after this child? This is really difficult territory for families. This is really complicated. They're both being found wanting and simultaneously being asked to care for ex children within the extended family network. Um, I'm not going to dwell too long on that, except to say, interestingly, and I don't know, I don't, again, I can't comment on what, whether this uh, applies for you, but social work is kind of disappearing off this agenda. So the Troubled Families Programme has very few social workers in it. 
and increasingly we're seeing the rise of all sorts of targeted services that don't include social workers. And so for us as a discipline and as a, as a profession, we're facing some difficult times. The quote here is from, uh, is from a, a Kurdish mother um, uh, who lives in London and they have axed the translation services. They've also axed the uh, CUT, the after school club that her children go to. And she is facing benefit cuts. And she's literally, her space to live is shrinking. She can't go to the doctors because she can't communicate with the doctor unless she takes her 12 year old to translate for her. She can't uh, go to work because the after school club doesn't exist anymore and she can't live where she's living because the benefits say, the benefits agency says the house is too big for her and she needs to move to a smaller space. We are literally shrinking the spaces for people to live. I'm going to talk about two things now. Breach has, has talked extensively about the ethic of care, so I'm not going to really dwell on that today, uh, except right at the end of this presentation. But I am going to ask us to think a little bit about family practices. We have uh, a, a substantial body of literature in sociology concerned with how family practices, how families do family. We're not terribly good in social work at taking that learning and thinking about it in practice. Again, you may have different experiences here, but we have really struggled as a profession to think creatively about how we understand complex, uh, challenging circumstances, how families do family in the face of adversity, how families cope with adversity, how they survive in adversity. And so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on that this afternoon. But let's start by thinking, what do we mean by family? Um, now again, you, you will have to nod or shake your head at me. <laughs> we, in, in practice, we convert family into who lives in the house with the child. Is that common practice for you? So when social workers engage, it's the parents. It's the parents and the child. We have a very limited view in practice as to who is family. And yet we also know from the research that who lives in the household is only a tiny bit of who is your family. But we've struggled enormously to find practices that capture the networks of children. So we are very preoccupied with the household and within that we are very preoccupied with the mother. And the mother becomes the focus and the root for so many interventions. Um, we did a British Academy, we were funded by the British Academy to do a piece of work with social workers about how social workers theorise family in practice. And uh, we did a series of focus groups with families across England and uh, we started those groups by asking them, what do you think family means? And social workers would give us a very uh, extended definition of that. Oh, you know, it's everybody that's significant to the child, it's the people around the child, great stuff. And then we gave them a case study and said to them, what would you do in this case? And you, absolutely across all those focus groups, they shrunk their intervention to mum, child and a little bit of dad. So what we talk about and what we do looks quite different. But that's terribly important. It's terribly important in practice because our practice isn't reflecting the way people live their lives. People don't live their lives in silos of services. Oh, um, this is an adult need, this is a child need. Do you prioritise your mother with dementia or your child with disabilities? We are asking families to make very difficult choices as they navigate their way through these silos of services. This may not be your experience, but it is, it is very much the experience in the UK. A product of that, is there's a shared experience, which is we don't properly understand families and families don't properly understand us. So none of the families that we interviewed in one of our studies was able to accurately tell us who was in their life and why. They had multiple interventions from multiple services, but just couldn't tell us who they were and why. The flip side is we are missing very important connections for children. Uh, one of the families I interviewed in the series case review study, it was an aunt. She uh, was living with enormous guilt because she hadn't realised that her uh, the man her niece 
I was having a relationship, was a profoundly dangerous man. He had, in fact, killed both the niece and uh, her children. It's been an awful, awful episode. Nobody had talked to the aunt about this man. Nobody had noticed the, rela the aunt's relationship with the woman and her children. She hadn't been included in any uh, meetings with the professionals. So she was absolutely devastated by the fact she felt she could have done something. But nobody noticed her relationship and nobody gave her critical information in that process. So what practices do make a difference? What do families tell us uh, it helps in terms of uh, our work with them? And again, this is reading across these studies. So families really uh, find it difficult that we see them as a child protection case or as a drug and alcohol case or as a domestic violence case. And the point at which they engage with us, that identity becomes fixed and they remain the domestic violence, the drug and alcohol, the child protection case. Somebody's nodding over there, so, so at least there's a shared experience. Also. Families move in and out of needs, in and out of uh, experiences, just as we do. You know, at the moment, in my family, we have some real problems in relation to an elderly relative who has uh, both mental health problems and, uh, and cancer. And those staff will know us as the family with the elderly relative with dementia and cancer. And that's how they'll see us. And that's identity is fixed. And what families say is that fixing of an identity fails to capture the rhythm and the nature of family life and the way in which needs uh, flux in and out. So don't give families a fixed identity. Demonstrate care in practice. You can be curious without being censorious. So you can ask questions of families in such a way that elicits information without people feeling that somehow they are being judged and they are being criticised. It's a very difficult balance. But demonstrating care and practice matters enormously to families. Uh, again, one of the examples I use is that um, in one of the families that we interviewed for the series Case Review Project, uh, the <laughs> The day that her daughter was killed, the washing machine blew up and she had other children. At that point, nobody was quite clear about the death of the young woman and what had led to it and what, uh, what, the, what exactly had gone on. The police were involved. There were a lot of people coming in and out of this family's house. But she'd also got other children to get off to school and all the other things that make everyday life uh, difficult. And the policewoman took all the dirty washing home with her, washed it, dried it, and brought it back next morning, all carefully folded up for her. She was absolutely, that, uh, that tiny thing stayed with her through all that trauma, through all that pain. That demonstrated care and practice made a significant difference to her willingness to engage with the services that then came in and out of her life. So it's just thinking about how we demonstrate care and practice in the most difficult and challenging of circumstances. The other, I'm not going to do it, I'm mindful of time, but um, I'll perhaps pick out the one about the quality of the practitioner. Families have a strong narrative about the quality of the people who come in and out of their lives, their confidence, their competence. We've just done a mapping exercise with some families. Bridget and I are involved in a another study and we've asked families to map the services so to draw them huge spider maps have appeared of different services coming in and out of their lives but families assign emotions to the services which we hadn't anticipated so they put things like cold good intentions but doesn't know much all sorts of narratives emerge for families about the services that come in and out of their lives our confidence, our competence is incredibly important in that mix. And thinking about how we hear from families about the quality of our practice is also very important. Very few feedback loops for families, very few feedback loops for families to say to us, actually, you really got that wrong. You needed to do this and instead you did that. 
Lots of lots of talk from families about practical help. We should not underestimate the importance of practical help for families when they are surviving some incredibly difficult circumstances. And we need approaches that recognise multiple identities, that you are a mother, that simultaneously you are a daughter, that you are a carer, that you are cared for. We tend to struggle in practice to work with those multiple and complex identities. And the final point there really is um, don't convert surviving adversity into a risk factor. Living through poverty is really tough. Don't turn living through poverty into a risk factor for that family. That family is surviving and actually probably surviving maybe a little bit better than I might manage in those circumstances. But don't convert surviving adversity into riskiness. And yet we do. I don't know if you do, for now, but we certainly do in England. So what are some of the things we do that are both uh, promote change within families but also inhibit change? Uh, partial engagement. We often see mum and child at the, uh, maybe at the child psychologist service, or we see dad at the anger management course, or we see uh, grandma at the kinship care group. And we are developing maybe some plans with them about going forward, how they might manage the child's behaviour or how they might manage particular aspects of family life. And we tell them and we only tell them. And then we expect that family member to go back into what is usually quite complex and difficult circumstances and convey that plan and explain it to the rest of the family. And then because actually it's quite difficult surviving everyday life, they may not do that terribly well and then the plan doesn't work. And then we say to the family, fail to implement the plan properly. And yet we have created the situation that makes implementing the plan really, really difficult. Because we, uh, certainly in England, really struggle with the notion of let's bring the whole family in to have a conversation. We are fearful of families. I don't know if that's the case in Finland. We are fearful of family groups. This discourse around, you know, troubled families has created this image of these difficult to manage families. And indeed, I've observed, I do quite a lot of practice observation, and I have observed social workers going to visit, getting to the family home. Mum's there, but so is mum's extended family. And they will say, I'll come back later when you're not busy. No, stay now and talk. So there's something about partial engagement. There's also something about avoidance because where you have fearful families, you also have fearful practitioners. We are dealing sometimes with really difficult situations. And sometimes, and we have to be honest, sometimes we choose to avoid some difficult conversations. The quote here is from a woman whose partner was in prison because the, uh, he'd assaulted her and the level of the assault was such and so grave and so serious that he was serving time in prison. And the social worker said to the uh, mother, he's really got to go. You can't have him back. He's, he's a risk to, to you, to the children. You can't have him back. And what she's saying here is she never told him that. She wasn't going to go to prison and tell this man that had hurt her to the degree that he had, that he couldn't come home. But neither did the social worker go to prison and tell the man that he couldn't come home. So we left this woman, highly vulnerable already, with a set of information to convey in preference to thinking creatively and carefully about how we might give that message to the person that needed to have the message, rather than placing it a strain on already a wobbly bit of this family network. And the final point I want to make here is that all the families in the studies, in all these different studies, get really fed up of practitioners that come in because we have a bit of a, we have such a turnover of staff in England, but also we have this notion of stuck cases, you know, families where there's no change. So we give them a fresh worker, give them a new opportunity, give them a different service. Families get really fed up with somebody arriving saying, right, let's start again. Because they don't want to start again. And actually, it builds up a level of resistance within the family. 
to repeatedly rehearse what your needs are and what your encounters have been with the services just reinforces a whole set of negativity about change, about being abandoned, picked up, put down by services. Fresh starts build resistance and it's really tempting to think somehow putting in a new worker is going to change things. Supporting existing workers, incredibly careful handovers are critical in that rather than repeated fresh starts. And this links to my uh, next point really, which is uh, families have a story about services. We're not very good at hearing it, but families have stories about services. And in all these studies, families can tell you about the services that have come in and out of their lives. And what you've got here is um, a really nice quote. If somebody helps and it doesn't work, you're still left. You're left with double the amount of work, really. And you can't do that anyway. So why should you now? Why should you let them in? So this sense of short-term targeted services, which we particularly adopted in, in England, so everything lasts six weeks or 12 weeks now, sometimes if you're lucky, six months. But everything is short-term. We have the duty team and then we have the long-term team. We have 26 weeks to get care proceedings through courts. Everything, everything is about timing in England. What it does is it fractures the relationships with families again and again. And families build up a story about this and an enormous sense of frustration and a feeling of abandonment. They all talked about workers who stayed in contact with them, even though the case was closed or had been moved to somebody else. And they all did it in a kind of don't tell anyone, but the worker still rings me or the worker still pops in. It mattered enormously because that's humane, because that's about real people, real relationships and real lives. So how do we harness some of the possibilities? Um, it's never enough to focus on the household. It's the part that is most scrutinized, yet likely to have the least capacity. Think relationally, know the child, know the family, know the community, and Bridge and I talk, and Sue talk about this in our book. One of the things quite often that families will uh, acknowledge as a real strength on the part of practitioners is when we are prepared to have ordinary conversations, not problem-saturated conversations, but ordinary conversations about everyday life. How much does milk cost? Where do you, how do you find the walk to school? What did you watch on TV last night? Ordinary, everyday conversations. The problem for England is that our practitioners don't have time for ordinary, everyday conversations. Time. Time, time, time. Everybody's worried about time. Seek out unbroken, helpful collections for families. We cannot be uh, best friends for families. We can't be families' buddies. We are practitioners. We have a particular role to fulfill. But how do we grow sustained relationships for families? How do we address issues of loneliness, of isolation in our practice? Where do we look? Where, how do we go beyond our engagement? We remain incredibly mother-centric all the time in all these accounts from families. The way into family is through the mother. The responsibility for change sits with the mother. Um, and the, the quote you have there is from a grandfather, a step-grandfather, who was told to wait in the kitchen whilst the social worker interviewed the grandma about caring for the grandchild. And what spaces and opportunities do we offer families to enact that? We know, the research tells us, families will do right by vulnerable family members given the space and the opportunity to do so. How do we create those spaces and opportunities in our practice? So a little bit of a kind of note of caution. So we have the rise in England of family group conferences, uh, reclaimed social work. Has reclaimed social work come to Finland? Yeah, which is systemic practice. Uh, I, I don't know if that's how you experience it here, but systemic family practices, really, it's kind of origin. Okay. Well, Reclaim Social Work may come to you soon. Um, restorative practices. So we have a couple of cities in England engaged in, in uh, wholesale system change, a move towards restorative 
services and restorative practices. So we're seeing strength-based models of practice starting to emerge in English systems. There is no doubt, and I've now evaluated three different uh, approaches to this, there is no doubt families really appreciate the change in tone, the move from finger-wagging to one that recognises strengths and possibilities. Families articulate that they can see and hear that change, and it makes them feel more positive about allowing people into their lives and about working with people. However, it's not enough. And the quote you've got there is um, from a, a family member saying, the social worker kept saying, this is brilliant. You're a brilliant parent. You're doing really, really well. But nothing had changed in terms of the needs. And this is where we have to be incredibly careful. Because you situate strengths-based models in risk-saturated systems, change can only be partial. You may change the tone and the nature of your relationship with the family, but whether you are addressing the underlying needs, which are about poverty, which are about social and economic determinants, has yet to be seen. And so we need to be very careful that we don't just end up in a situation where families say, yeah, I really like my social worker. But. However, they do get... A, one study shows that social workers and families did come to some kind of reciprocal uh, empathy, really. So in this study, what was really interesting, it was a local authority that had adopted uh, systemic family practice as their model. Uh, families talked really sympathetically about their social workers' caseloads. They really felt sorry for the social workers who were carrying such heavy caseloads, and they didn't want to bother them, and they really understood they'd got a lot on. Now that's a shift. That's a shift from hating your social worker you know, recognising they're busy and appreciating their caseload. I don't know if it gets us that much further forward in terms of supporting change, but at least it means, you know, family's caring for you, you're caring for the family. <laughs> and I wanted to conclude, really, by thinking a little bit about, and I'm going to use family group conferences as a uh, example of this. I've just finished looking in... Uh, in depth at a set of interviews with families. All the families had uh, what, what we have this awful term now in England called sequential removals. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, if anybody introduces it here, you've just got to stop. <laughs> so sequential removals is the term that's been used for women who have repeatedly lost children to the care system. Yeah? So maybe children have been removed from their care two, three, four times. And there were all sorts of studies in the UK because what's been noticed is that this group of families uh, are prolific users of the care systems and the courts and are, are overrepresented, really, in the statistics. But the word's been used as sequential removals. So removal one after the other after the other. And my, this study, I've just coming to the end now, has been with families, all of whom the women have experienced se sequential removals. All the mothers in this study have had previous children removed from them. And we have a whole, uh, a whole set of activity about this in England. We have all sorts of schemes, treatment schemes, therapeutic schemes, we have schemes that ask the women to take contraception whilst they get this treatment and this therapy, um, all sorts of interesting developments. These women hadn't had any of those. What these women had experienced was the opportunity to come together as a family and to make a plan for the next child, for the child that's due. All these women had been able to keep the current child, despite previous children being lost to the care system. And in fact, they were living through the heartache of dealing with the adoption of some previous children while simultaneously caring for the current child, which is a really tough call when you think about what that involves. But the family, brought together, had been able to develop a safe and appropriate plan. So over 90% of families are able to do this, but it is rare currently we provide the space and the opportunity. And remember, we're using family here in the broad sense, not household. Rarely are we seeing systems that can accommodate this space and opportunity. 
What I would say is that if you're able to do so, the evidence today would suggest positive changes. And I know I'm looking at the back because you and I have had these conversations before about family group conferences. But they are one example of an opportunity that we may provide families to enact that ethic of care. So I'm nearly there. Um, I suppose I want to conclude by saying that kind of model challenges us to think differently about families. It says we can't other families. We can't see them as feckless and failing. We have to see them as having a, a, a particular set of opportunities and resources and relevance for a child. We also have to shrink that space. We have to shrink the space between the people that need our services and those of us who deliver those services. Because in doing so, we will create partnerships and alliances that allow new and innovative approaches to be developed. Um, and I guess that's the link into Breesha's conversation this morning about system failure. That for many of these families, uh, what is uh, being assessed as high risk is actually a result of system failure. And finding new ways and new relationships with families will allow some of those things to be articulated. So I've left some references there. Um, th that's just some of them, but um, I'm sure Breesha and I would be happy to share more with you if they're useful. Thank you. Thank you, great, uh, very much. This was this was very interesting and um, important also. And uh, now you didn't take all the time okay. we had <laughs> planned for you, so we have uh, time for questions and comments. And uh, I hope you uh, use the opportunity to ask uh, something uh, from uh, of Kate. So. And I must say uh, first that uh, when you said uh, many times that I don't know if that's the same uh, in Finland, but uh, at least I recognized uh, very much similar uh, in Finnish uh, so, uh, social work and, and uh, uh, child protection social work. So I think it's terribly mm. easy for us to, um, I don't know, Again, I'm saying I don't know if it's the same yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. It sure. is terribly easy for us to blame everything. You know, it's not about our practice. It's about the systems in which we sit, about the way we're managed. It's about the way we are audited. It belongs to somebody else. But actually, some of what this is revealing is that we need to just think differently and we need to practice respectfully. And sometimes we just don't manage that. And we that belongs to us. Relational practice belongs to us. And that means we have to be critically reflective of our own practices and the way in which we choose to understand the families that need our services. Yeah. All right. Somebody want to ask? Oh, there's someone. Wait a minute, I'll take this microphone for you. Thank you. When do you deal with the family? How a uh, social worker deals with the family? How does he or she uh, avoid the possibility that uh, the family might think that he or she is a threat to them, to take the child away from them? So the family wants to keep some things secret or uh, tries to avoid discussing what really matters. I do this exercise with social workers where I get, uh, in, uh, when I'm training them, when I get them to think about their own family and what they would be prepared to tell and not tell a professional. And we all start to edit information and we all start to withhold information when we think it's a social worker that might be in our lives. And that's because everybody thinks we're going to take their children away from them. Now, we can either keep trying to invent new assessment systems that get us to the truth and force the family to tell everything, or we can recognize that maybe offering the family spaces and opportunities to arrive at their own resolution 
and to think carefully about how they might want to respond to the child removes some of the uh, need for us to constantly interrogate and scrutinise that family. So we've certainly found with the family group conferences in Leeds um, that that's been terribly important and, we're, uh, and Leeds is going to try and bring the family group conference right forward so it happens before the child protection systems kick in because it's about thinking differently about how families communicate with each other what they're prepared to communicate with us existing assist assessments certainly in, in england existing assessment processes really shrink how we understand and think about it so i think uh, i think we're on a bit of a lost cause if we think somehow we're going to arrive at some set of uh, assessment tools that allow us to capture everything. I don't think that's going to happen. I think sharing the responsibility for making the difference with the family shifts us to a different place and shifts assessment to a different place. Does that make sense? You want to comment? <laughs> Bridget and I were once quite brave and talked about the need to, um, to think about getting rid of child protection, which um, we don't say very often because people shout us down. But we have got to, uh, we've just written an article, we've got to stop feeding the risk monster. We've got to. In fact, this makes uh, partially sense because I am thinking that the threat uh, should be handled, for example, by removing the decision process away from the social worker so that the family really has a fact. No, the family knows by fact that the social worker doesn't make decisions or his or her superior makes the decisions, but uh, somebody, some other organization that is independent of the social worker. So the decision making process would be separated from the social work itself. I think you, you, it's another layer, isn't it? It's another layer of communication you brought in and certainly, uh, uh, I mean, the family uh, narratives in, in our studies, the accuracy of information is a big issue for families. How accurately we record information and convey information is a very big issue for families. And I don't know where that would fit with what you've said. It's, I think it's quite complex. I think it's difficult introducing that extra layer. Okay, Baby has asked a comment or question. Yes, thank you very much. And I was asking you earlier before you came to lecture that, well, we have these ideas on uh, ethical and humane organizations and, and how to work better, but somehow it, it's it's very difficult to think that the organizations would actually change. They like seem permanent in their ways and and we were talking a little bit about how, what, what would bring transformation and you've been talking about shortening the distance between developers and managers and the people and have you found any great innovations in England for that like bringing together people, families and, and we, we have some developments on that also in Finland. We have these uh, experts by experience mm -hmm. and we should like strengthen that. But do you mm -hmm. have any, any experience on that? I think um, we've certainly got some small local organizations that have tried to think quite innovatively about how you might bridge the gap between professionals and families with uh, all sorts of peer mentoring systems so families will be part of the service, help deliver the service, help design the service. Nationally, the, probably the thing we've got is your family, your voice really, which is a national alliance of practitioners and families who are involved in care and protection services who've come together to try and challenge and change the system. So it's absolutely rooted in a shared approach to this and I think that's only just begun and it's going to be really interesting we're doing a piece of empirical work to support that bridge and I ask me in a year where that's got to I think it will be really interesting yeah, yeah. all right there's 
time for one question or comments. Okay. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just thinking about this um, work about relationship and kind of relational work. And I'd like to ask, what's the discussion like in England about resources? Because in Finland, we always hear the, like, that the social workers know how the work should be done, but we just don't have enough resources. There are too many families to meet, and there's just not enough time for work like that. So how is it in England? It's exactly the same. I think I've got two questions. One is, uh, social workers have, um, I don't know if Breach would agree, Breach may not agree with me on this. Um, <laughs> I think we have lost our political voice, so I don't think we make sufficient arguments about resources. We have seen cuts beyond belief to the services to the families we provide a service to, and yet we have failed as a discipline and as a profession to stand up and shout about that. So I think there's something about that. I think the second thing is, and this is worries me, but we have, because our social workers have become so used to this bureaucratic way of practicing, I worry that they're actually a bit scared of practice. So even if you stripped everything away, how confident would our frontline staff feel about direct work, about you know engaging children, about engaging men who are, uh, have a history of aggression, about working with complex families where there may not be a shared language. Uh, so we've almost de-skilled, and then the danger is you retreat behind your computer because actually you don't feel confident to do some of the work that needs doing. So I think it might be a mix of those. I don't know if that's your, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree on <laughs> all that you said, because it's actually something that we've been talking about in our team uh, of social workers, that um, there's kind of a fear that the social workers are losing their um, kind of profession mm -hmm. and abilities and the skills mm -hmm. to actually meet the people, because in so many communities, the social work is only about directing people to write yeah. services yeah. and not about actually doing the work yourself. So it's about assessing and then showing, okay, you go there, there's the right yeah. service. And yeah. that's not social work. Yeah. Um, I sound like, a, a, I mean, I don't know where the Leeds work will go, but in Leeds they've got rid of the notion of thresholds. Because social workers have become so preoccupied with assessing whether or not families meet the threshold, so they just got rid of thresholds. So there are no thresholds. You can have a conversation about needs, and then you can have a think with the family about where that need might be best met, but leads will not have thresholds. It's going to be very interesting to see where that takes practice. Yeah, brave, brave thing for them to do. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Ja nyt jatketaan.